Magandang araw sa ating lahat. I am Eulalio Gieb III, or Ellie, of the Department of Broadcast Communication, University of the Philippines, Diliman. Let me first thank the organizers of this conference for the invitation to deliver the keynote lecture for UGAT's conference this year. My lecture is titled, Small Data, Big Ideas, Shallow Facts, Deep Insights, Simple Coastal and Island Communities as Little Places for Huge Realities of the Global. When Ugat invited me to give the lecture, I readily accepted it. But a few days after accepting the invitation, I started to harbor trepidations. I may have done a considerable number of studies on islands and coastal communities, and I may have spent practically two-thirds of my life immersing myself in these communities. But which to cover for this lecture among the wide range of themes of the so many issues that these communities face is something that I found difficult to discern. One example is my research that focuses on the journey of specific marine species, from where they are caught, how they are distributed in the village, how they circulate in different layers of the trading chain, and then only to find out that only about five to 10% of fishers catch stay in their community. The rest travels in multiple sites. I now begin to question many of our marine conservation initiatives. For example, the idea of, of pouring in huge investments in the sea when one of the major contributors uh, to extraction, to high extraction, is beyond the seas, which is trade, both national trade and global trade. Lagi kong sinasabi sa marami, gusto ninyong iligtas ang dagat, huwag kayong basta-basta magpunta lang sa dagat. You want to save the seas? Do not go to the sea. Pumunta kayo sa pamilihan. Go to the market. Nandoon ang malaking dahilan ng pagkasira ng dagat. The market is one of the major reasons why our seas are dying. At dumadaloy rin sa merkato ang mga ugnayang pandipunan at mga koneksyon ng mga tao na nabubuhay at umaasa sa dagat. While preparing for this talk and after having scanned the titles of the accepted abstracts for this conference, it also dawned on me to include the idea of Kapuluan beyond the seas as an object of interrogation. Where is the island outside its enclosed islandness? It was then that I decided to include in this lecture some personal encounters in non-island places that in my view, are significant ways of an island's becoming. In all these settings, I always look for one important thing. Where is social justice? How is justice formulated and calibrated in human relations? I realize that everything that I have mentioned so far is partly because, or perhaps mainly because, of our misappreciation of small data, so-called shallow facts that we encounter in so-called simple and small communities. This is what I seek to address in this lecture. For this lecture, I highlight the value of small data. Mahalaga ang maliliit na datos sa pag-unawa ng ating mga ugnayan sa pamilya, sa kapwa, sa ating mga komunidad, sa bayan, sa ating mundo, at higit sa lahat, sa sarili nating ugnayan sa ating mga sarili na siyang pinagmumulan o isa sa mga mahalagang bukal ng ating pakikitungo sa pamilya, kapwa, komunidad, bayan at mundo.
paborito, paborito ko itong sabi, no? hindi maliit ang maliit. At huwag maliitin ang maliit. Now, let me now proceed with illustrations of the general views that I have laid down in this introduction. Let me begin with Karunoto. His real name and whose image you see on your screens that I used with consent for my study. He is a mangrove planter in one of the small islands of central Visayas. I cite this case to illustrate islanders' understanding of the contemporary politics of marine enclosures and how such enclosures were a function of the political ecology of mangroves and commercial brackish fish farming. The case of Carnuto has served as the launching pad of my discussion of the historical decline in mangrove forests and the corresponding increase in fish pond areas in the community as being consistent with the trend or with the trend on the national scale from the early American colonial period until the end of the 20th century. It reflects the impacts of shifting global marine extraction practices and national fisheries policies in line with the requirements of several forms and layers of the market, as well as the global circulation of resources, peoples, and rights in a place. I also see this phenomenon of what scholar calls or what scholars call ocean grabbing in the case of tourism businesses like beach resorts and similar activities enclosing the mangroves and fishers customary docking areas. Now, let me go back to Carnoto, no? who narrated to, to me small details of his experiences from which we could infer the conflict between mangrove owners and fish pond operators in the context of trade and competing resource claims. He almost turned into a raging attack ready to cast an unforgivable spell of terror over all those involved in the loss of his mangroves. An agta is a dark, hairy, loincloth, bearded male creature that inhabits the mangrove forests. That was how Carnuto described himself when he lost his 15,000 mangrove trees. A query sent to those high up in the village's economic and political ladder, he felt defenseless when a fish pond owner accused him of trespassing on his territory. He said that the fish pond owner threatened to bring the issue to municipal officials if he would not clear the mangroves that he had planted next to the fish pond. Carnuto did not put up a fight. He knew he had no rights over the site, but neither did the fish pond owner. It was public land. But Carnuto had no nerve for trouble. Among mangrove owners of the island, he was the least likely to endure conflict. He and his children cleared all the mangroves he had nurtured for seven to ten years. He could not understand why the fish pond owner took ten years to warn him about his trees. Before I learned the complexity or before I learned about the complexity of the mangrove aqua farm political dynamic, I had always run into Carnuto whenever I walked through several passageways of the mangrove forest of the island during my research to pay my informants a visit. The passage channels intersect and crisscross each other, defining the geometry of plots of mangrove trees. Those chance encounters gave me the impression that he was a man wandering aimlessly in the mangrove forest. It was in the third quarter of my field research in 2004 when a resident and Carnuto himself made it clear to me that he claims ownership of the mangrove forest that I had been traversing. In other words, he was not walking aimlessly in the forest. He was inspecting his forest, inspecting almost every branch or twig for signs of violations or 
examining footprints in the muddy swamp or looking for any sign that would indicate that people have passed through his forest. He walked every day in his mangrove forest. To walk every day in one's mangrove forest, that is a mangrove planter's obligation. His walk was not an aimless wandering of an itinerant traveler. That was how he nurtured his trees, most of which he had lost to fish pond owners. Mangrove owners believed that an injustice had been committed against Kaknoto, but they kept their opinion to themselves, and no one from among them, not even anyone from the village council, stood up to defend what they perceived was a transgression of a mangrove planter's right. Many among them believed in their rights as mangrove planters. So passionate was their belief in those rights that they would die for them, except for a few like Kaknuto, who would rather stay quiet in his den. It was that small detail of chance encounters in the, passage, in the passageways of mangroves that brought me to my examination of the bigger politics of mangrove forests and conflicts that were a result of a growing market and shifting policy that skewed toward aqua farming. One huge issue implicated in this phenomenon is the contention of rights to resources. Now, let me proceed to the next case that I want to illustrate here. On the eve of the annual May Fiesta in another island in the Visayas, my research team and I, together with a young man who was a member of a fisher's organization in the village, were having a boisterous chat on our boat, which was anchored on the front shore of the island. We noticed a group of young men or a group of men doing something inside their no-take marine protected area. We rushed to the site and we saw non-villagers constructing what looked like a frame for a fish cage, the purpose of which we had yet no idea. We would learn that the barangay captain approved one project of an international conservation organization inside their marine reserve. To cut the story short, a series of dialogues was initiated by the vocal people of the island. Many villagers maintained that their opposition to the project concerned mainly procedural violations. They were not informed and consulted about the project. They were not included in the decision-making process. The barangay captain went beyond this role and many more. One prominent public forum was held. In attendance were high-ranking members of proponents of the project. The director of an international research and marine conservation organization that was pioneering the project the chair of an international funding agency supporting the project, the head and another community organizer from the Philippine Office of an International Aquarium Fish Trading Network, a representative from the municipality that has jurisdiction over the island where the project was being implemented, and a municipal council member from the island's neighboring town whose residents were those constructing the fish cage. Now, during the course of the discussion, the dialogue turned nasty. The meeting ended up in highly heated exchange of raw threats and insults. In less than a week, islanders saw project proponents dismantle the bamboo cage that they had constructed in the marine reserve. The village captain informed me that proponents move the project to another island. I cannot pursue here details of the intricate entanglement of each in the network of kin, economic, and social organizations that were at play in the issue. I can only understate the nature of these village level relationships. That is, these connections serve as the fulcrum that tilts the balance of power in the well-distributed access to decision-making processes related to marine reserves, including how shifts 
have also engendered alliances of resistance, even if only temporarily. The village or the incident illustrates nuanced exercises of village level resistance to unjust translations of conservation principles that mainly emanate from external sources, which flow into community managed projects that reconstitute village level resource rights arrangements and place based decision making processes. I draw three main points out of this statement. First, I contend that the main issue of the incident lies in a misconception about how communities are constructed and how they function. NGO project proponents and municipal officials appear to have acted in good faith in enlisting community consent through the village captain. However, the premises the premises upon which their view of community was based seemed to have disregarded local processes of consensus building and to have excluded several communities of stakeholders. Second, the experiences of the islanders that I have illustrated here provide valuable insights into the commitment of islanders to their project their strength as social actors and into the processes of making rules and decisions that shape responses to conservation interventions. In all these situations, resistance is always present, the causes of which are the very same arrangements upon which conservation practices are predicated. These sources of resistance are the very same sources of authority and legitimacy that always come into play in the governance of local resources and village life, something that certain local and global NGOs and local government units have failed to recognize in their idea of community when they introduced the fish cage project inside the island's marine protected area. Third, the community, which is the local in this equation, the community becomes the place upon which local global engagements of social actors play out multi-layered processes of rulemaking and decision-making that unfold in the space of the marine reserve. The issue highlighted the calibrations of power among community processed local global alliances. The shifts impact on village-based partnerships and if or when required by circumstances, village level resistances that are often founded on relationships established on the basis of existing local social arrangements other than those recognized by donor organizations. These voices of the wider local civil society in efforts to reclaim the confidence to dialogue in equal terms with local global actors, shape other local processes of community consensus, which play significant functions in the dynamic of globally inspired village-based conservation projects. Now, let me now share with you a case that illustrates what I call the political economy of tears, the local and the global elsewhere. In 2003, I did an ethnography of a caregiver in Montreal. I joined her in one of her weekly church activities. The whole day in the church was practically a day of songs, praises, and worship. The pastor said, Lord, we are claiming today the miracle that you promised us. Immediately after the pastor shouted these lines in front of the crowd, the cacophony of hallelujah and amen started to get louder. Sobs turned into wails. Whispered cries became screams. The wailing got louder and louder. The pastor kept on invoking the Lord's promise of a miracle to this crowd of Filipinos. 
I could no longer remember the exact words of the pastor, just that he mentioned the hope of the crowd before him in these prayer requests. Filipinos expecting the approval of their immigration or citizenship papers, or the approval of the working visas of their loved ones in the Philippines, or the resolution of their immigration problems, or the employment opportunities they face in Montreal. As I turned my gaze around the hall, the images that I saw sent shivers in my spine. A web of raised arms, a multitude of hands, clutching wallets, passports, identification cards, immigration, uh, immigration papers, folded documents that I could not identify, shoulder bags, Bibles. I felt a rush of inexplicable emotions and my thoughts started to form chains of images that I had just seen. Those images for me were a contest of values, Bibles and passports, rosaries and wallets, crucifixes and immigration papers, God and Canada. This last image that I had chalked up in my mind gave me goose pimples. As my thoughts negotiated these images in the spaces of my mind, more images of overseas Filipino workers started to lodge themselves in my brain. Dead Filipinas going home in a box. The dead going home every day. There was so much pain in those images. There is so much grief and inhumanity in the language of those images. All these insights about those emotions and images and the political economy of fears and hopes and homes, all of these, all because of one small little short moment of the ethnographic encounter, yet so deeply and disturbingly profound in its expression of a differently situated Kapuluan, the Kapuluan elsewhere, an elsewhere that is mediated by the global supermarket of diasporic identities and the reconfigured discourses of market-informed kinship expectations and obligations. All these are embodied in the small details of wallets, rosaries, passports, immigration application papers, and all converging within state-sponsored export of itinerant care, bodies, women, humanity, and everything and anything about a desperate government in need of money to run the national economy. At ginagawa ang lahat ng ito sa kalakalang global ng panimilpihan. Nagbabago ang hugis ng kapuluan. Dahil sa mga maliliit na bagay tulad nito, ang lalim ng mga bagahe ng naglalakbay na kapuluan ng sarili at bayan. Now, let me proceed to, my, to the last case that I will illustrate in this lecture. My study in 2013 to 2014 with the Philippine Missouri Your Partnership Incorporated about end-of-life cell phones had provided the organization valuable lenses through which to view our anti-commercial mining campaign. Our small cell phones embody the death of our mountains, the death of many indigenous people's places, all because of gold, silver, palladium, copper, and many minerals that are needed to produce our cellular phones. We see in minute details all these minerals in our mobile phones, in our laptops, computers, and many electronic devices. We always say we are saving the trees because we are reducing the use of paper, which we derive from our trees. I now find this Save the Trees campaign to highlight the need to cut on paper and shift to computerization as not completely supported by empirical evidence. Our shift to computers for most of our work 
to cell phones for our communication and many media uses, and to many electronic gadgets for our daily life. All these things only mean one thing. We need to extract more gold, more silver, more minerals to produce these electronic gadgets. What do these imply? We disturb small communities, small communities that are dependent on our forests. Many of these sites are places of our indigenous peoples who are often the victims of eviction based on the need or because of our need to draw from the earth the substances of our electronic dependent lives. Lagi kong sinasabi sa mga estudyante ko, sa pagbukas natin ng ating mga cellphones, sana ang una nating makita ay ang mukha ng isang katutubo na itinaboy sa kanyang lupain. Pero of course, ayaw natin makakita ng mga katutubong itinataboy sa kanilang mga lupain. Nakatitig sila sa atin, nakatitig siya sa atin. Ang kanyang mga mata, nangongonsensya mula sa screen ng ating phone o computer. May posibilidad na inagawad natin ng lupang minuno ang ating mga katutubo at iba pang mga settler community sa bundok. May ironiya ang ating panawagan ng katarungan para sa mga katutubo kung tila walang hanggan ang pagyakap natin sa malawak na inovasyon ng ating buhay na mataas ang dependence, napakataas na nakadepende ng malaki sa cellphones sa computers, sa ating mga gamit elektroniko. Ang kaloob-looban ng ating mga gamit elektroniko ay ang kaluluwa at mga pangarap ng mga katutubo. Hindi malayo ang lugar ng ating mga katutubo. Wala na sila sa bundok. Nasa cellphone natin sila. May bahid ng kanilang dugo ang kaluluwa ng ating mga gadget elektroniko. Let me add this important incident. Many of the negative impacts of mining flow into the sea, like Lingayan Gulf in Pangasinan, that is so full or that is full of mine tailings coming from uh, mining operations from the mountains of Benguet. And do not forget the case of Mark Copper in Marinduque, which hosts our conference this year. My colleague filmmakers and I documented on video in the late 1980s, Mark Copper's negative impact on Marinduque's small and quiet communities. We were able to document the discharge of mine tailings into a portion of Kalankan Bay. That was before the mining disaster that happened in 1996 when Mark Copper's toxic mine wastes spilled into rivers into several communities and displaced many households. This incident is now considered one of the worst mining and environmental disasters in the country. Pulupuluman ang ating mga buhay, magkakaugnay ang ating mga kapuluan, mula dagat hanggang bundok, mula, mula sarili hanggang bayan, mula loob hanggang labas. The few examples of the small ethnographies that I have described in this lecture implicate the expansive reach of the global and the narrow scope of the local. The cases have invoked the local always in reference to the global. The sheer size and weight implied by the global is juxtaposed in contrast with the diminutiveness and lightness of the local. I now call into question the underlying assumptions of the contrast made between the local and the global. I am challenging the assumed centrality ascribed so tersely to the global and the supposed marginality attributed so, methodol attributed so methodically to the, to the local. Let me repeat that. No? I am challenging the assumed centrality ascribed so tersely to the global and the supposed marginality attributed so methodically to the local. Indeed, 
the global may appear dominant and the local seems like a defeated hero lying prostrate in the battlefield. I contend that the dominance of the global does not necessarily equate with the centrality of the global or the marginality of the local. My main point is that both the global and the local are central forces deployed by social actors, structures, and institutions who come from both or either the non-local world or the local community. As central forces, both operate simultaneously on separate but linked spaces. It is a relationship of two central social phenomena that is so full of tension, each with its own set or networks of social forces. They are linked, but they are also simultaneously disengaged. Now, in spite of the seeming gluttony of the global, not everything about the local is totally lost. Arturo Escobar, one of my favorite scholars, says that all that the global does is confront the challenges posed by the local. In fact, not everything in the globalization process is included in its operation. Another scholar, Arif Derlich, points out that many are left out in the globalization process, which makes questionable to assume that the global is universal. Conceived this way, the global loses the magnitude that are often associated with it. Notwithstanding its seeming omnipresence, the global is only a single phenomenon among multiple realities faced by people at all levels of the social hierarchy and in all dimensions of negotiated social relations. Now, what do these reformulations imply? Given the reformulation, we begin to recognize the globalization of the local by the local itself. These are not new phenomena, and these have been happening since decades ago, but expressed in different articulations. One articulation of the globalization of the local that I want to emphasize in this lecture is the potential and existing practices of various forms and pockets of local resistance movements that need to tap or have formed alliances with transnational regimes of similar persuasions to fight a local oppressive state or an unjust global political and economic order of many transnational regimes themselves. In short, the local can form alliances of locals to make themselves compellingly global to counter a dominant set of unjust globalized locals. I put forward the idea that the global and the local are two separate processes that relate to each other in multiple ways but simultaneously move in either parallel or opposite directions. I am operationalizing Escobar's argument on the centrality of place. What we need to highlight now in the local global dynamic is the central position we can assign to the local. The aim is for the local to conquer the global. Let me phrase this another way. The aim is for the just local to conquer the unjust global, to open up the spaces for the creation of a just global. In other words, the just local has to create a just global, not another image of the unjust global, because to do so is an invitation to tyranny. In short, our task is to create a different global, a counter-global. 
it is at this point that I forward the idea of adding or not neglecting another factor that I find missing in the formulation of sustainable development, which is the sustainability not only of development, but most important of all, the sustainability of just human relationships. This vision is being carried out in the present by many small place-based resistance movements that are linking up with other local communities to form national and global alliances of their interests, one of which is to sustain their lives in their respective local places. Here are a few more final words. I have always been asked by some colleagues and many of my students how generalizable my observations are to make such small observations gain acceptable levels of validity, reliability, accuracy, and precision. I always only have one response. I do not generalize across cases. I generalize within a case. Of course, that response is not mine. That is Clifford Gertz's explanation of our ethnographic epistemology. One more caveat before I end this lecture. I want to share with you a serious question raised by scholars Jan Agnew and Stuart Corbridge. They are asking us, are we mastering space or are we empowering communities? They say that what should be attempted is a counter hegemonic order based on a broad diffusion of power among a large number of actors committed to a set of universal principles of reciprocal interaction without entrenched domination. Indeed, we need to go back to the massive capabilities of the local. We do this not to redeem the world. We do this to redream a just global world of sustainable human relationships. The idea of redreaming the world is not mine. I borrow it from one of my favorite novels, The Famished Throat by Ben Oakley. I end my lecture here. Thank you for sparing me a huge amount of your time to listen to my thoughts that I hope would find a concrete fruition in my conversation with you today. And let me thank again the organizers of the conference for this opportunity to have a dialogue with our colleagues. Again, this is Eulalio Eli Gieb III. Maraming salamat.